Hello again, everyone. Welcome to Scripture Verse by Verse. My name is Michael Moret. Reading, studying verse by verse in the book of Proverbs, we pick up our study in chapter 26, verse 9. So get your Bible, open it up to Proverbs 26, and uh, we'll begin in just a minute. Just a reminder to you that the Scripture Verse by Verse website is found at the Bible Verse by Verse. Dot com and that you can study the Bible from Genesis through Revelation using my audio Bible messages as always at the Bibleversebyverse.com. Going through the Bible from Genesis through Revelation at your pace, at your convenience, right there at the Bibleversebyverse.com. Okay, Proverbs chapter 26. Father, we ask that you would sanctify us by your truth. Your word is truth. In Jesus' name, amen. Proverbs 26, verse 9, As a thorn goeth up into the hand of a drunkard, so is a parable in the mouth of fools. If you give a drunkard a fistful of thorns, he's probably going to pierce his hand, and he might not even feel it, because the alcohol has dulled his senses. Or if he does feel it, he may just laugh it off like a fool, even though it could get infected. The alcohol has dulled his senses to something that could be a problem. And in the same way, you can quote the Bible to a fool. Remember who a fool is. A fool is somebody who who doesn't have any regard for God, doesn't have any regard for the Word of God. You can quote the Bible to a fool, or a fool can read the Bible or listen to the Bible being taught, and he has absolutely no idea what it means, and he doesn't care that he doesn't know what it means. That's the real dangerous thing. He has no appreciation for holy things. A fool has no appreciation for God or the Word of God. And you know why? This is it. This is why. It's because the unsaved are spiritually dead. And they are unable to comprehend the Word of God because they are spiritually dead, which is why it's a waste of time to try to make an unsaved person behave like a saved person. Just, you can't do it. You shouldn't even try. You shouldn't even expect it. And you sure shouldn't get frustrated with them. You can't make an unsaved person behave like a saved person. You might be able to modify their behavior some sort, to some degree, you know, with threats of punishment or or promises of rewards if they do that, but that's not glorifying to God. That sort of thing doesn't cut it with God. God cares about motive as much as he cares about actions. And Behavior modification doesn't cut it with God because God is looking for people to serve him out of love and to serve him from their heart. And it's not going to happen with somebody who is unsaved because they don't appreciate God and they certainly don't appreciate the Word of God. They're spiritually dead. This is why the church has to focus on getting out the Word of God. We wasted, multiplied millions and millions and millions of dollars for decades trying to make political change in this country rather than putting that money into into ministries that were getting out the pure word of God and preaching, preaching repentance and preaching hell and preaching salvation through Jesus Christ. If we would have done that for the last 30 years, maybe this country wouldn't be in such a mess but try to change it through politics. Try to make an unsaved person behave like a saved person. It just doesn't work. Get people saved. And then their lives will be conformed to the Lord Jesus Christ and the Word of God by the power of the Holy Spirit. i got an example of this in my own life. I remember I had my best friend through high school and even afterwards. I mean, we were going completely two completely different directions in our early 20s. In our mid twenties, I, I got saved, and and he was becoming more godless. And he disagreed with me on abortion. He disagreed with me on homosexuality. He disagreed with me 
on, on every issue of morality. I didn't try to change him. I was saved. He was not. I didn't try to change him. And uh, he, he was going to school down the University of Wisconsin, Madison, extremely godless liberal place. And uh, while he was down there, believe it or not, he got saved. And you know what? I saw him a, a few months later. He came back and he had changed his position on all those moral issues. And it wasn't because I tried to force him to act like a saved person when he wasn't. He got saved and then he changed because he was no longer spiritually dead. So that's why we have to get out the Word of God. That's what transforms people from the inside out. And then they start behaving the way God wants them to behave. Verse 10, The great God that formed all things both rewards the fool and rewards transgressors. In other words, God will make sure that everyone gets what they've got coming. Especially the unsaved. The Bible says that God does not give Christians what their sins deserve. So they've got that coming. They don't get it because Jesus took their punishment. But let me, let me uh, uh, go on here a little bit and explain what I'm talking about. God will make sure that everyone gets what they've got coming in this sense. He will, he will reward Christians for the good works that they have done in addition to giving them the gift of salvation through Jesus Christ. For every good thing that we as Christians do after we are saved by God's grace through a gift from God, every good work that we do after we're saved, we will be rewarded for in heaven. It's true. That's what the Bible teaches. And God will also reward the wicked with all the pain and suffering that they deserve while they're burning in hell for rejecting Christ. They'll get that. There are different levels of heaven. Different degrees of joy and eternity for Christians, depending on how much they worked for Jesus. God is fair. He is just. And there are different degrees of suffering in hell for those who reject God's mercy through Jesus Christ. The more light that you sinned against, the more times you heard the truth and sinned against it and rejected it, the hotter the flames of hell are going to be for you. Verse 11, As a dog returns to his vomit, so a fool returns to his folly. In other words, you can't cure an evil person. And this is just what I was talking about. You cannot cure an evil person. You cannot cure an unsaved person. An evil person will, re, will re, repeat their sin and no one but God can change them. People try to get sinners to change and all they get is frustrated and discouraged because it's like trying to get a dog to stop doing dog things. Oh, you can put a ribbon on a dog. You can make them sit and shake hands. But the first, the first opportunity they have to eat their own vomit, they'll do it, or worse. They'll do it because they're a dog. And likewise, you can tell an unsaved person what God says and that they should do all good things for the glory of God, but the first chance they get, they're going to commit a sin. Verse 12. Seest thou a man wise in his own conceit? There is more hope for a fool than of him. The person who thinks he is wise, but is not, is a dangerous person. The person who thinks he is wise, but is not, is a dangerous person. People like that give wrong advice, and their advice causes trouble. And that's just the beginning. There's a whole negative domino effect from something like that. You know, it's bad to be ignorant. It's bad to be a fool. It's bad to disregard the teaching of God's word and have no regard for the true God of the Bible and the true Jesus as revealed in Scripture. That's bad. 
and to be a fool as a result. But it is much worse to be ignorant, foolish, but think you're wise. Especially if you believe it's your calling in life to save the world from their foolishness. That's a dangerous person because the ignorantly foolish try to solve problems with stupidity, which creates even bigger problems, which they then try to solve with more stupidity, which creates even bigger problems. 13. The slothful man saith, there is a lion in the way, a lion is in the streets. In other words, a lazy person will look for any excuse he can to avoid work. And what they usually don't understand is that most people know the difference between an excuse and a reason. Verse 14. As the door turneth upon his hinges, so doth a slothful person upon his bed. A door moves, but it doesn't go anywhere. It moves a lot, but it doesn't do anything. And a lazy person changes positions if he gets uncomfortable. He might change his position an awful lot if he gets uncomfortable, but he's not going to get up and do something worthwhile. A lazy person may move a lot, but he doesn't do anything worthwhile. He doesn't make any progress, just like a swinging door. Never goes anywhere. A lot of movement, but it doesn't go anywhere. 15. The slothful hideth his hand in his dish. It grieveth him to bring it again to his mouth. Now that's a lazy person. I am telling you, that is a lazy person. I mean, it's one thing to be so lazy that you don't work. It's one thing to be so lazy that you don't do something that you find unpleasant, like working. It's not fun. It's one thing to be too lazy to do that. But boy, you really hit rock bottom when you're too lazy to lift the fork and put your favorite food in your mouth. You're just too lazy to do that, so you starve to death. That's bad. That is, you know you've hit rock bottom when you're too lazy to do something that you even enjoy. God says you're a sluggard. 16. The sluggard is wiser in his own conceit than seven men that can render a reason. Yeah, you can't tell them anything. There are some people you just can't tell them anything. Or do you know people like that? Can't tell them anything. They got their mind made up. They're closed-minded. They believe what they think. It's not based on reality. It's not based on the Word of God. But you're not going to change their mind because they're comfortable. Seven God-fearing, Bible-taught men who agree that the foolish sluggard is wrong and tell him so will not convince his sinful, stubborn heart in the slightest. Fools won't change their ways no matter how many people warn them. Only God can change a sinner into a saint. Only God can change a person's ways from the inside out. Only God can transform a fool into a decent human being. Only God. Only God. And it happens as a byproduct of a sinner realizing they're hell bound, going to go to the lake of fire, going to pay for their sin forever and ever in torment. When you realize that's true, and you realize that Jesus Christ died on the cross to pay for your sin, and that he's your only hope to avoid that horrible place called hell. When you understand that's the way it is, and you repent of your sin, and you ask Jesus Christ to be your Lord and your Savior, that's when God can start working on you because you become alive spiritually. And you start thinking straight. Your eyes are opened. I remember the night that I got saved. I'll never forget it. It was... It was, it, was, it was a strange sensation that I feel, felt. After I got saved that night, it was in a church. I remember it was as if I was hoisted 
above the earth. And I was looking down upon the globe from orbit. I was just looking down. And the feeling was that I just, this, I'm not a part of this anymore. I'm not, I don't think like them anymore. I don't have their values anymore. I knew that right away. I just felt like I was separate from the world. That that wasn't me anymore. I'm not a part of that. 17. I love God. I love God's colorful sense of humor. He that passeth by and meddleth with strife, belonging not to him, is like one that taketh a dog by the ears. Now, I don't want to be legalistic, okay? I don't want to tell you how to run your life. So if you want to grab a dog by its ears and twist those ears and lift that dog off the ground, that's your business. You just go right ahead and do that. But I wouldn't let go if I were you because he's going to be angry. You don't want to let go of that dog. If you grab a dog by the ears, you have done a very foolish thing. And in a situation like that, you probably shouldn't keep squeezing and holding on to those ears. You probably shouldn't do that because he's just going to get more and more angry. But you better not let go either. You got yourself in a problem. You got yourself in a no-win situation. Both ways you're in trouble. And so is the person who meddles in a quarrel that's none of his business. What'd you do that for? Once you do it, it's too late. Something bad's going to happen to you. And of course, that's the case anytime we violate the word of God in any way. Something's going to bad happen. Something bad's going to happen to us. The Bible says we reap what we sow. If you sow to the flesh by doing something contrary to the word of God, you're going to reap trouble. And there's no getting around it. It's going to happen. It's going to happen. 18. As a madman who casteth firebrands, arrows, and death, so is the man that deceiveth his neighbor and saith, Am not I in sport? Hey, it was just j joking. In other words, he does something that he thought was funny, and it caused problems. Real problems for his neighbor. And then he says, well, I was just joking. It was just a joke. Well, we better be careful about the jokes we play because our sense of humor can be just as ungodly as the rest of us at times. A joke played on someone isn't in good taste and isn't funny unless the one who had the joke played on them laughs. You know, if we kid someone, and they don't laugh, it's because we have struck a nerve. So instead of being funny, we have hurt them, and that's not pleasing to God. 20. Where no wood is, there the fire goeth out, and where there is no tail-bearer, the strife ceaseth. Gossip is often evil speculation upon evil speculation. You think about gossip, isn't that what it is? Evil speculation upon evil speculation. That is gossip. And gossip is a sin. It's one that's not talked about very much, I bet. But it's a sin. Because it's not right for people to talk about others and speculate as to why they do this or why they do that or why this happened to them or that happened to them. It's not right to talk and speculate about it. That's gossip. And those who gossip usually do it, at least in part, to make them feel better about themselves. Isn't that true? When they put others down, they feel superior. But actually, truth be known, when someone gossips, they are going to look, they are going to look not superior. They might feel superior, but they're not going to look superior. They're going to look inferior to anyone who has any measure of spiritual discernment. They're not going to be impressed. People who gossip are exposing, if nothing else, a pathetic walk with Jesus Christ, if they have a walk with him at all. 
And I say that because if somebody is saved and they've got a good walk with Jesus Christ, they have a good relationship with God through Jesus Christ, they're going to be content, they're going to have peace, and therefore they don't have to get their kicks by slandering others behind their back. 21. As coals are to burning coals and fire to wood, so is a contentious man to kindle strife. Fuel feeds the fire, and someone who quarrels because they like an argument feeds strife. 22. The words of a talebearer are like wounds. They go down into the innermost parts. Man with his sin nature eats up gossip like it was his favorite food. And of course, the gossip, when, when someone gossips about us, that, that doesn't taste very good. What a double standard. Isn't that true? But that's what God is saying. People who enjoy gossip should remember our Lord's command. Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. If you don't want someone saying bad things about you because it upsets you, well, then you shouldn't talk about somebody else behind their back. 23. Burning lips and a wicked heart are like a potsherd covered with silver dross. He that hateth dissembleth with the lips and layeth up deceit within him. So, earthenware, which is what this is talking about, earthenware was dull-looking, not very attractive, almost worthless. And that's why those who made it also would cover it with a shiny silver glaze. The glaze disguised the true nature of the earthenware. It was still worthless, dull, stuff. But the glaze made it look better, at least outwardly. And God says some people may have words that sound loving, but it's just glaze. Some people have words that sound loving, but those nice sounding words, maybe flattery, are just the glaze covering a heart that is filled with hate. So don't be, don't be taken in by somebody's smooth words. Give people time and their true nature will come out. 25. When he speaketh pleasantly, believe him not, for there are seven abominations in his heart. He whose hatred is covered by deceit, his wickedness shall be revealed before the whole congregation. Seven abominations means that he is full of hatred. There are seven abominations in his heart. God is saying he's full of hatred. And God says their wickedness, their true nature will be revealed. People can only trouble or cover their true character for so long. It eventually comes out. Even the slickest liars eventually expose themselves. They slip up and they contradict themselves. And if you're sharp, you pick up on it and don't overlook it. And don't think that they can be trusted with other things if they have told you a lie. Liars cannot be trusted because they have proven that for whatever reason, they will tell a lie, something that God hates. But eventually people, their true character comes out in their words. Or maybe when they think someone is not watching, they'll do something bad and expose themselves. Boy, I know a man, and, and he's a salesman type, and he's just so gracious, and he is so friendly and complimentary and flattery. Oh, I mean, and some people just lap it up, you know. And I see right through that kind of personality. I've lived long enough to recognize what that is. And I, and I told somebody, I says, I'm not going to say anything, but he will expose himself. Oh, boy. You hang around with him, and it's not long. When he's not trying to flatter someone, 
his true character comes out, and it's dastardly. It's evil. It's disgusting. It is slanderous. It is complaining. It is taking God's name in vain. Oh, he's no longer the smooth, slick-talking, snake-oil salesman. His true character eventually comes out. What, what do you think, man? Do you think God is fooled by your, your glaze? By your shiny glaze? And what difference does it make if people think you are really impressive and you can flatter them into trusting you and getting some? What difference does it make if people buy into that rot when God Almighty sees right through it and he's the one you're going to have to stand before on Judgment Day? Don't be fooled. See, that's why it's, pati- it's important to be patient and really, really get to know someone before you commit yourself to them. Take your time. There's no hurry. 27. Whoso diggeth a pit shall fall therein, and he that rolleth a stone, it will return upon him. God tells us to do good to those who are bad to us. Someone says, well, okay, if I do that, who's going to make sure that those bad people get what they've got coming if I don't do it myself? Well, you want the answer to that? I think you probably already know. God will. God will avenge his people. God will punish evil. And many times the bad person will suffer the same type of pain that they caused others. Oh, he'll get them back. And it's not, it's not uh, ungodly retribution. It's justice when God does it. And the punishment always fits the crime. The wrath always fits the sin. Let him take care of it, okay? 28. A lying tongue hateth those who are afflicted by it. God says a liar hates the person that he lies about. A liar hates the person that he lies to. If you you tell a lie to someone, I mean, any kind of lie for any reason, even if it's well-meaning, even if it's to spare their feelings, you are hurting that person because you're not giving them the truth. And like I've said in the past, when somebody doesn't have the truth and they are believing a lie, they're going to make decisions based on something that's not true. And the truth always catches up to us. And when they've and when they've discovered that you've lied to them, even if your motives were good, they're probably never going to trust you again. Just don't lie to people. God hates it. 28. A lying tongue hateth those who are afflicted by it, and a flattering mouth worketh ruin. Flattering, flattery is a sin. Flattery is one of the most disgusting types of lies, I think, that there is. Flattery. People tell people what they want to hear even when it's not true. Why? Because they want something in return. Flatterers use people to get what they want. And, and again, it's a very hateful thing to do because it manipulates people. Of course, you know, you can make yourself flattery proof by being saved and being on fire for Jesus Christ, finding your contentment and your satisfaction in a close relationship with him. You can make yourself flattery proof because if you love Jesus more than anything or anyone, You can't be flattered into doing anything that you otherwise would not do. You're not buying it. You don't care. I'm out of time. Continue studying the Word of God at thebibleversebyverse.com. Click on the book you want to study. Click on the chapter. Open your Bible. Follow along and listen. Study the Bible from Genesis through Revelation using my audio Bible messages at your pace, at your convenience. Again, at thebibleversebyverse.com. Please remember, we're brought to you by your prayers and financial support. You want to be a part of this ministry, this faith ministry, where I just give out the Word of God and trust that God's people will be moved by Him 
to give and to pray. Click the donate button at the top of the front page at thebibleversebyverse.com and give as the Lord may lead. Out of time, so long.